Hi, this is Rachel from Washington Academy of Languages, and we are here, four of us, to give our presentation today about presentation strategies. Hi, hello, my name is Harvey Duncan, and I teach the Assistant MBA program for the Washington Academy of Languages, and I also teach in the School of Arts and Sciences. So even though I teach primarily in the English language proficiency department, uh, my methods, or the methods and strategies covered in our presentation will apply to any course where students are required to complete group presentation. Alright, so the purpose of, the present, of my presentation today is to explore what can get in the way of effective team working in group projects and presentations, how to create assignments geared towards teamwork, and how to keep students accountable for their work. So before a group can make a presentation, they need to work together effectively to prepare their content. So I'm going to focus on that aspect of this presentation. So I'd like to highlight some fundamental ideas that can lead to better team working outcomes. Some of you might recognize Lev Vygotsky. He found that learning happens best through social cultural processes. So students learn more when they have to work through uh, problems in a group rather than just learning through observation. This is called social constructivism. And I've been interested in using his ideas as a framework for educational pedagogy. So let's use him as a base to help our students learn about working together. In fact, everyone presenting here in our team today is going to cover some aspect of social learning theory. <clears throat> uh, there is, however, one major roadblock to effective team working. Uh, we've all heard the complaint that someone in our group isn't pulling their own weight, and it turns out that this is a completely normal side effect of working in a group. Mm -hmm. Quite a few years ago, social psychologist Max Ringelman did an experiment with a tug of war, and he found that people working individually pulled harder than individuals working in groups. This came to be known as social loafing, and it happens everywhere from the classrooms to the boardroom. That means that there will be students in our classes that take a rest while the other students work. So what are some of the causes of this? <laughs> well, one of the causes is diffusion of responsibility. So as the number of people in the group or team increase, people tend to feel de-individuation. This term defines both dissociation from individual achievement and the decrease of personal accountability. Uh, the another effect, another uh, cause is the dispensability of effort. So when a group member does not feel that his or her effort is justified in the context of the overall group, the individual will be less willing to expend the effort. So if the group size is large, members can feel that their contribution is not worth that much in the overall goal. So if someone, another uh, problem is that people might feel like others in the group are slacking off and then a person will lower their own effort to match that of the others, and that's called attribution equity. Um, there are actually many causes of social living, but one of my favorite ones is called the sucker effect. So if you work hard in a group, you might be afraid that someone will steal your work and take all the credit. So to avoid being the sucker, you're going to put in less effort. <clears throat> so the best way to reduce social loafing and encourage participation in group work can be found in the three C's, collaboration, content, and choice. Collaboration is a way to get everyone involved in the group by assigning each member a special role. Content identifies the important, importance of the individual specific tasks. So it shouldn't be meaningless busy work. It should be something that they know is important for their, uh, their goals. And the third one is choice. So if group members have the opportunity to choose the task they want to fulfill, um, they'll be more likely to step into that role. So another way to increase accountability um, and limit social loafing uh, can be limiting the scope of a project, uh, keeping the group sizes small, use peer evaluations, and uh, progress portfolio. So how can we create a lesson that utilizes all of these aspects? Well, the first thing I like to do is create a contract. So here's an example of a contract um, that limits the scope. So you might not be able to read it right now, but we'll have copies of this later. Uh, however, in this assignment, the goal is to create a presentation that focuses on whistleblowing, which is a specific aspect of a larger topic, which is business ethics. So we limited the scope to make it a little bit more accessible. <clears throat> and if the group is broken up into important roles, each student, uh, which uh, the, sorry, the group here is broken up into important roles. So I have the three roles here. And uh, each one is very important to, con to completing the goal. Uh, so each one has a different uh, job. And down at the bottom, everyone gets a chance to choose their role. And so they write their names 
inside uh, the role, and then they sign it so it becomes a contract. So that way you can hold them to um, their presentation and stuff. Uh, at the end here, uh, portfolios. So at the bottom of the contract that I create, students are required to turn in all of their work uh, in a portfolio. So it reduces social loving by helping students track their own progress and identify who is completing their special tasks. So the instructor can also use an atomized uh, grade based on the quality of work and that's done by a rubric. Um, it really helps reduce the sucker effect because it can uh, limit the collateral damage of students who aren't really pulling their weight. Uh, finally, students reflect on their peers' performance as well as their own, and they're asked to think of ways that they have overcome conflicts and so on. So the quality of feedback can also be graded by a rubric. Uh, peer evaluations send a signal to the group members that there will be consequences for non-participation. So peer feedback is important because it helps to reduce social loathing caused by the attribution equity phenomenon. All right, so in conclusion, awareness of social learning and group psychology can help to maximize participation in collaborative projects and give students a rich and meaningful learning experience that will impact them professionally. Thank you for listening, and I'm going to hand you off to Rachel here. Thanks, Harvey. So I have been a senior faculty here at Wall since 2013, and I currently teach in three departments. Um, I primarily teach communication courses, so I'm going to focus on practical tips that you can use both online and in live classes to help your students create higher quality presentations. While Harvey discussed group presentation strategies, I'd like to focus a little bit more on individual strategies. So I'm going to introduce several practical ways to model presentation assignment expectations reduce student fears of public speaking, and promote better student work outcomes. These are the five areas where I'm going to offer suggestions. Presentation examples, scoring rubrics, detailed outlines, assignment expectations, and an assessment activity. If you want students to create excellent presentations, it really isn't enough to ask them to just read the assignment directions. People are universally afraid of public speaking, and especially when many of our students are performing in English as their second language, they need to see examples of high quality presentations that they can mimic. Give them scripts that are the ideal example written by professionals. Show them videos of engaging tasks, and enga excuse me, engaging talks, and inspire them to copy the techniques. When you lecture, be a great speaker yourself, so every lecture you give is a model. And finally, provide many resources of what to say during a presentation, how to say it, and even offer students links to online tutorials. I'm going to show you a few of my favorites at the end of this talk. So providing rubrics is actually an activity that you can do with your students. If there's four levels of standards on the rubric, you want to give students four examples of scripts, or four videos, or four presentations, and represent each area of the rubric. Do this as a live classroom or an online activity. I usually do it about a week prior to the due date. If you can't, if you can't meet the standard or exceed it, it's because you don't understand the rubric you're being judged by. Outlines. Outlines should be uniquely tailored for each assignment, and you should emphasize inclusion of all the details. This means writing them yourself to match your own expectations. Using a generic outline for, that you find online, it's, it's just really not enough. Ask students to fill in their outlines, to send you a copy by email, and give useful feedback to your students right before the presentation. Outlines can be on paper, or they can be completed on the slides. I like to request both. And when you get them, demand to see references, citations, notes, and outlines on PowerPoint slides themselves, because this prevents plagiarism and ensures that you have really high quality resources. About expectations, um, in live classes you really need to take the time to go over the presentation instructions and the deadlines step by step. 
In online classes, you should offer Skype office hours or use Collaborate sessions. You have to carefully explain presentation assignments. Use any platform, actually, that allows Q&A with your students about the assignment expectations, and even reward students who participate in uh, these Q&A sessions with extra credit points. So finally, in assessment, uh, in this activity, you can do it online, or you can do it in the discussion board, or you can do it in a live class. You're going to let students do the grading, so they get to decide which standard on the rubric, uh, where, where it would fall if they, you look at sample scripts, videos, or outlines. This also can help them to understand the rubrics better and to understand the expectations that they need to meet or to exceed for their desired score. So when students engage with the models that you provide, the main benefit is that they generate ideas while they're engaging. They generate questions that they might not have had otherwise. It really gets them thinking about what they want to do and how they want to do it. You might be thinking this is extra work for instructors, and actually it is, especially <laughs> the first time you try to do it. But when it comes time for final assessment uh, and giving feedback, it's actually easier. First of all, the quality will be higher, and you'll have already seen the presentation completed in small stages before the final assessment date. And it's also good to keep uh, the best samples from previous quarters. You can scrub the names or identities of the students and just use the samples as models for the next quarter. This is a list of my favorite resources, and uh, these will be available to you uh, at the end of the presentation, so you can look through them. Thank you for listening. I hope this has been helpful. Now I'm going to pass it over to Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Cater, and I teach at Wall in the uh, ESL department, uh, assisted MBA, and also I teach French. I'm going to talk about a specific kind of individual presentation, which is student as expert doing a complete lecture, lecture series. And I call it having skin in the game because I want to move from this kind of a presentation, which is probably pretty good, and uh, which probably got a pretty good grade, but probably also the only real listener was the professor. I want to move to something a little bit more like this, where everybody in the class is intensely invested in each other's success, uh, where they have a deeper inquiry into the content because they're helping to uh, research it themselves and to present it, where accountability and growth are intrinsic to the process and where the final grade is more of a byproduct of the process than the, than the goal itself. I should say that this is more geared towards face-to-face -to -face classes, but of course it could be adapted to online classes. Um, I also want to say that this can work either in a presentation skills class, like the ESL classes that we teach, or it can happen in a content class. But I think in the content class, the teacher has to be a much more um, a firmer guide because they've got to uh, adhere to a curriculum. So the student as expert. Uh, the student has a long-term personal investment in becoming an expert on one specific topic, one piece of the curriculum. Uh, they are responsible for delivering five to eight lectures in the term. and they have to do research that goes way beyond uh, just what they need to fill up the PowerPoint slide because they're going to be asked questions and they actually have to have a deeper knowledge than what's on the surface. Uh, the presenter is responsible to the audience for comprehensible content because the audience is responsible for taking tests on this content. Um, and the audience, by contract, is responsible to the presenter for giving feedback and asking questions that go deeper. This sort of feedback loop uh, means that there's really not much necessity for external controls. This starts to take on a life of its own pretty quickly. There is a role reversal. The students are doing most of the teaching. And the professor is a mentor, a guide, and indeed a student. The setup 
each student chooses a topic for the term. If it's a skills course, um, they can choose anything they like or love and want to share. In a content course, obviously, curriculum that has to be fulfilled means that the, stu the student's got to consult more with the professor. The student does a lot of research and uh, needs to cite everything correctly and has responsibility to plan the entire lecture series. Uh, the professor will review and revise and advise. Oops, let's go back here. The implementation, the student does, the student as expert does just about everything. They create the visuals, the handouts, they deliver the lectures, they conduct review sessions and Q&A sessions, they create and create uh, correct the quizzes, and the quiz score, by the way, does count in the final course grade. The audience, by contract, has special uh, requirements as well. They've got to take notes, obviously, because they're going to be taking a test. They are responsible for actively questioning. Each student is required, for example, to ask one question per, um, per presentation. Uh, they take tests, as I said, on the content. And in this, they actually help the speakers to improve lecture by lecture because they're constantly asking more questions, making it clear what's not important to them or what isn't clear to them and what is important to them. There are caveats and cautions, particularly in a class that's content-based. Uh, the professor is definitely going to have to uh, suggest proper sources, alert students to crucial points that they might not be aware of, has to be very actively participating in the class as a course corrector, listener, questioner, commentator. And they have to take the tests. And if they're like me, they haven't uh, been taking as many notes as the students have, and they may not always pass that test. Finally, evaluation and grading, this is done mostly by the student evaluating himself or herself via a video. You can fill out a self-evaluation rubric. Uh, the, any of the um, instruments that both Harvey and Rachel have brought up can be used. This can, is very much at the discretion of the professor. But again, th this is a sort of self-improving process. The, the teacher doesn't have to step in too often, I have found. Long-term benefits are much more active listening skills, ownership of content, and there's a, there's a real um, development of inquiry, a spirit of inquiry in the class that I don't see otherwise. Radical reduction in stage fright, and students really get interested in doing deeper research. Finally, there's a tremendous sense of accomplishment for having completed a five to eight se session uh, series, and they have an actual takeaway at the end of the course. I'm going to pass this on to Hong Ying. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. <coughs> um, my team, uh, as my team has presented that learning is a social process, now I'm going to talk about scaffolding, particularly how to help students uh, polish their presentations. I'm Hong Ying Douglas, senior faculty from Washington Academy of Languages. Um, I will talk about four things. One is communicate grading criteria. The second one is create effective visual aids. The third one is using uh, use presentation language. And the last one is the most important one is practice. Now, communicate grading criteria is extremely important. Uh, because students need to know what you want. So this is an example of a case study that I gave to my students. Um, they need to understand what, what they need to do, what their case study should include. So uh, there's specifically the title, uh, the background, the hypothesis, and also how uh, methodology, everything that you need for a case study. So when they finish the case study, they have to give a presentation. So to make sure that I, they know what they need to do, what, they, what is expected, so I create this PowerPoint template. So all they need to do is just put the information, the data they have found, and then step by step, it's, uh, it's a very uh, well-written, created PowerPoint. 
So I believe that give them what they need and let them know what you need. And the next one is explain rubrics. Um, I always believe that you need to tell them what you want. And if, the, if you don't, they don't know what you want. So explain the rubrics to them in detail. All right, so create effective visual aids. Now, a lot of the students are very creative and artistic. So when it comes to creating visual aids, it becomes like an artistic experience. Somehow, the messaging part is forgotten. So here, two, I, I believe two most important things related to uh, creating uh, visual aids is clarity and simplicity. So on the right hand side you see this is an example done by uh, a Chinese uh, student who actually was educated in Germany. Now I don't want to spend too much time on this, but here you can take a look at the, the one that I'm pointing at, opinion. So the, the blue part uh, of the slide talks about how the West, people from the West express their opinion, and then on the right hand side is how the people from the Eastern part of the world express an opinion. You have only one word, opinion, but it's very clear and very simple and very effective. Now, I'm going to talk about the common mistakes, but I decided to use the word sins because it sounds more serious. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the first one is text heavy. Uh, look at the first one, the, the one I'm pointing at. Um, I don't know the purpose of this slide. It seems like it's a reading comprehension exercise. But once you put this on the, uh, on the, project, uh, on, uh, on the computer screen, the audience don't really know whether they should be reading or they should be listening to you. So we need to follow the six by six rule. Six words per slide and six lines per slide. No, six words per line, six lines per slide. You got my point. The next one is data overlay, uh, overload. So we have charts and we have graphs and it looks very like a well-researched uh, uh, presentation, but at the same time, as audience, we don't know what this slide is about. So it needs to be cleaned up. The next one is picture with no purpose. Look at this one. I like this one. It's a bad example. You've got eyeballs, you've got suits, welcome, everything. I guess it's, a, it's about selling suits, but it is just too noisy too loud, it's not effective. Now the next one I want to talk about is um, students need to uh, learn the presentation language. Because my, the, the students that I teach are second language learners, they get nervous, they are worried about the content, they're worried about everything, and at the same time, if the teacher can provide the simple language sentences they can use, that would be great, uh, very helpful. And also I tend to give them choices so they can practice and choose the ones that they can pronounce the best. The next one is accountability. Um, they need to, uh, students have to be accountable for their own presentation. Uh, and I would like to ask the students to give multiple uh, submissions of their video and audio. Because video, students, they're very critical of themselves. They will check. They make sure they look good. And also they pronounce well. And if you really want to check the pronunciation, you can ask them to submit audio recorded. Because sometimes they may think they did a great job, but they, can, they, can, they cannot recognize what they're talking about. And then the self-critique and peer critique, they're both very useful. And the last one is make sure teachers give students enough time to practice in class. So you can be there for them and correct right there. And the last one is Toastmaster. This, uh, Rachel mentioned Toastmasters already, and uh, I, I like it as well. I just want to say one thing. On the Toastmaster website, you will see uh, the links for resources that teachers can choose from. Now, before I start the question and answer, I would like to say hi to Harvey's mom, <laughs> who is listening and watching our presentation. Let's, Thank you. Who is listening and watching our presentation in Alaska? So, yeah. hi, Teresa. <laughs> so, uh, Rachel, question. We have here. a quick question here from um, Teresa Garrick. So, you're asking me if uh, students ever copy the the samples that I give. Actually, they they tend not to because they are. Uh, checked every step of the way, right. and uh, because I do that, it gives them more chance to be creative. Um, here's another question for Jane. Yes, um, have I tried the flipped classroom technique in an online? Not full out. Um, certainly I've had students um, 
giving lectures and so on and collaborate or on YouTube. Um, but I actually, t I can see how it would work quite well because um, sometimes, not by no means always, discussion board can have a little bit of a busy work side to it. And um, if discussion board were used for the kind of interaction, um, it would be better. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for listening.